My name's Troy Byler, born in January 29th, 1943. Jeff Davis Hospital, Houston Medical Center. My great-grandparents, I never knew them, and then, you know, knew all the other ones now, so we was all from Fed County over by the Grange. Before you were born, what are their kind of background on the Byler side? They came, Grandpa came from, uh, would be, you know, Grandpa, uh, from Tennessee with his half-Indian wife and settled out there on them post oaks and tried to make a living out of that old poor, poor, poor land. And did, you know, a few cows, a little corn, you know, just, you know, plowed with oxen. And I can remember all that. And Grandpa was out there plowing with oxen and, uh, and shucking corn. And like I say, we're a bunch of hillbillies. <laughs> What about on, on your mom's side? Her maiden was Hoffman. Hoffman. So tell me about the Hoffman grandparents. They were Flake, F-L-E-C-K. And um, but then they went back to Hoffman. But uh, they was, um, they all come from, they were a little more sophisticated, I guess. Grandpa owned a store in a service station in West Point, Texas. The store's still there, yeah, about seven, eight miles west of the Grange. He didn't do nothing work every day. You know, just continue. What do you know about your your dad growing up as a boy? I don't really know what he did. You know, he, odd jobs. I heard he went out to West Texas for a little while, but... Uh, I don't know what for, why, but anyway, he come back and went to work for the railroad. He was in the uh, signal department, which they put up all these gates that's crossing and the red lights on the track. And stuff. Do you know how your mom and dad met? I don't really know how they met besides they lived right there in the same community. We all went to a little church there in the community and uh, it was so funny that women would, the men would bring the women and the kids down, and the women would be carrying a bunch of uh, quilts and stuff, and pallets. The mom would go in and bed them all down in, the, in between the pews, you know, and then the men would stay out in the truck and drink whiskey and <laughs> wait till service get over with. And then they had a preacher come in, Brother Burns, and he was going to set the world on fire. It didn't last. I don't even think got a smoke out of it. All the people went together. I remember working down there. One of the brothers, he my uncle, gave him a little two or three acres of land. But he was a high flute preacher. And so whatever he wanted, he got. So they built him a complete house, you know, just pieced together and everything. Did he work for the railroad in Houston? Yeah, he was working out in San Antonio. They gave him a choice of uh, going to San Antonio or staying in San Antonio working or going to Houston and work. So he, for some reason, he went to Houston and never could understand understand why he did, but uh, anyway, he finished out his whole deal, 40, 48 years. We lived in a boxcar. It wasn't a boxcar, it was a camp car. And so daddy was foreman. So the foreman could take his wife and kids and they had their own car. And then they had a car behind it, it was a cook car. And uh, that was a supply car and all that. They had a full-time man. His name was John Henry. 
And he done all the cooking and everything for Mama and had another guy down in another car, a tool car, and he would, uh, oh, this is going to get too tough. Oh, yeah. We would, uh, well, they'd go, go to put in some gates or crossing or something or another. So train would come in, the engine would come in, pick us up. Mama had an hour to pack everything up. And then we were riding the train to the next location, wherever the job was, and stay there for two, three, four weeks. And I knew all the men, so they all, I was the only kid out there, so, you know, they kind of took you in and let you ride on motor cars and stuff, all the stuff you don't supposed to do. And I didn't go to school, it was in a camp car. And so we settled in the north side of Houston in a railroad yard out there. So that's where we went from there, in that railroad yard. There was plenty to do. There was always something going on. There's a new machine coming in or a derailment somewhere or something. It was a heck of a lot. I got pictures of my first steps in Appleby, Texas, and there was a platform there where they backed up unloaded stuff on a wooden platform and then got pictures of running around out there on that platform my first steps yeah all of a sudden the rule come down that was getting rid of all the camp cars and I'm going to uh, uh, trailer houses so that was the next process which I don't remember any of that, so that must have happened after me. Same thing, they, we went out and built uh, camp spaces for all the men, and uh, so they drag a trailer out there. And you had a brother born a couple years after you? Yeah, five years and seven years. Oh, you had two brothers? Yeah. When did you finally get to start regular school? I don't never remember anything connected to school with the camp cars. But uh, I guess the really I guess the parents did what teaching was to be done. I can remember the last place we was in, the school bus would come down there and get us. And uh, down in the middle of a rail yard, circle up and pick up the kids and go to school. Did y'all move between elementary, middle, and high school? No, we stayed pretty much in the same. I mean, we'd go to Lufkin or some Beaumont or whatever doing jobs, and then we rented a house over right north of the rail yards in Houston. So Daddy worked out of there. About the same time I started school, you know, elementary, it was always temporary on the railroad. You never, you never knew where you was going to be, when, how, what. But it was just a good job for Daddy, for an old kid to come out of the post oaks, nothing but a wood chopper. And all of a sudden, he's out there driving a company car around. and you know, Provided a good life for y'all. Oh, very, very, very well. And we still had country up in and up. Fed County up where my grandparents were all at. So Daddy kept some and bought some and was running a few cows. So give us an excuse to go up around weekends and take out a few cows. Daddy bought a new Mercury. They planned a vacation and I was, you know, which is little. <clears throat> so they took that car and we went to the Grand Canyon and went to California just with a little water bag hanging down the front grill and a little wind deal up on the window and air blowing in. And, you know, so, heck of a trip. Yeah, it really was. It was really, and then Mama didn't trust no cafes or nothing for to eat, so we'd always eat at a roadside park or she'd cook up her eggs and stuff, you know. Poor folks, man. Mom and Daddy never drank. 
or we had, you know, pretty quiet on them. We was in church every Wednesday night, or Sunday morning, Sunday night. It was plain and simple. I was in going to junior high and high school, playing football. By this point, did you have a pack of buddies, some friends? Did you end up with some? Yeah, some of them I shouldn't have. No, I had just normal, you know, friends and stuff. Football, people I played football with and stuff. But we wouldn't end up agriculture at all. Everything generated around church or around school. When did you start driving? Well, then you get your driver's license at 14, trying to make dates and stuff, you know. 14 years old out there running the roads. Mm. Because using mom and daddy's 53 Ford, it was kind of my car, and then they bought a 50-something, another Ford. I was knocking holes in the muffler and same old stuff, you know. Same things as today? Yeah, same as today, you know, making noise. How were you as a student? Got by. I had too many other things I wanted to do. I was just stepping stone, you know, to get on where I wanted to be. What well, was still like, and then I watch Jesse and his boy Blaze are carbon copies of me. Cause they just went out of school, couldn't let me go do my thing. Did you have any? Uh... I don't know, boyhood, like jobs, after school jobs or summer jobs? Yeah, uh, I got a little paper out and uh, did that for a little while and uh, then worked to service station. Daddy bought that service station for us, for me and my brothers, and give us something to do. And what cross streets was the golf station at? Right there at uh, Coop Elementary, right across the street from it. Uh, we looked it up yesterday. Uh, Aldine Westfield and Parker, Parker Road. Was there a dating scene? Was there a nightlife? Church. Church. Girls from church. That was an easy one. When did you start taking an interest in football? I started in junior high, high school. I did one year of college. I had a guy that was raised down the road from me, and he was an All-American, Demry Jones. And uh, so he went out there at the same time I did. He said, boy, you better wake up. Somebody gonna knock your block off. And I ain't no you know, running around like two bandy roosters. And, uh, He's the one that did it. I mean, knocked me out cold. Welcome to college football, son. Yes, sir. Well, the fact that you played in college means you had at least a little success at the high school level. What what position did you play at Sam Houston? I was linebacker and a pullback, running back. Every report card day, you bring your report card, standing line in your gym shorts and it shows the coaches your report card. And so it was a graduated scale of so many slots for a D and so many for an F and conduct and all that. So, and them coaches all sitting around with a chain around their neck. I done the last one. I see seeking raises and off the floor like he did the last one. Whop. Oh. Oh, put the hurt on you. Football team, got a fall festival, and one of the things is, is the, they paired up different ones and had boxing matches in the gym. Got your head knocked off. Who's Jesse Myers? He was my competition. He was the other running back. They was kind of matching you up that way. Mom and Daddy bought me a new car about my senior year. And so then it was on. I had a 59 Pontiac two-door hardtop. Catalina? And I just sold it. I've had that thing for, oh, yeah. You had it since then? Yeah. I just got rid of it uh, all back 
six, eight months ago. Outside of church and school social life, did you get about Houston at all? Did you know? Really, you just stayed right in the whole day in the north side. I shot one of my first deers where Intercontinental Airport is now. So you'd already started hunting at this age? Yeah. Oh yeah, we always hunted daddy. And squirrel hunting, cows. When you're getting out of Sam Houston High School, you decided to go to U of H basically because it was closest and your parents wanted you to. That's... Yes. Okay, so you're at U of H in 1961. What was your major? Pre-med. You were a pre-med major? Mm hmm What did you want to do? My mama wanted me to be a dentist. So one of her friends had went through the pre-med, so we got hooked up. And so I was up every morning at 6 o'clock or so watching a lecture on Channel 8 on TV. And they used to do that. I didn't like none of it. You take a 18, 19-year-old kid, set him down in front of a TV at 6 o'clock in the morning, studying biology. Didn't take long. Did you have a better idea of what you wanted to do? No, I had no, I did not have a clue. In driving out to U of H, we lived out by Intercontinental Airport, so pretty good drive. I'd drive that drive every day and look at all them businesses and, and which one I wanted to do. You know, all the floor companies and the whatever. And so, none of them stuck. I was just trying to get an idea, some, some way to go. U of H had a campus in the old M&M &M building over the ship channel, right there to the north end of Main Street. And uh, so at that time was Vietnam. I figured I'd rather be up there in that classroom working for the railroad. Had three kids at home. All them little exemptions every month would come in. So that's what I was living on. So you found yourself in law school, which was way better than the, the board. And law school didn't last that long. What was Armor Meats? Armor Packing Company. You worked there? Yeah. Well, I had a route. I'd drive a truck to A&M one day, and I'd go to Sam Houston to the next day, and then I'd go to Nacogdoches the next day. And so every day you bring your truck in, and you pull it up there, you plug it in, and so then they load it overnight, and then you come in and unplug it, except I forgot to shut the doors when I come in the, one morning. So I had little white packages all up and down the road. So I got fired from that. We gotta go back in time. 1955, that's when you met? Mm-hmm. How did you first meet your wife? And we was going to the same church. What happened? Did you guys date in high school? Yep. I told her one night I was taking her own to church. And uh, I said, I'm going to marry you one of these days. So I did what I set up to do. She never went to college. She liked, uh, wasn't going to get married to. She got her high school deal, and so she went out there to San Jacinto High School. They had a summer deal, so she took a load of classes to get her GED. Okay, then y'all got married in July of 1963. Were you already working for Southern Pacific? Yeah, I was in the engineering department. We laid out tracks traveled a lot. And y'all finally get married that summer. Where did y'all get married? And Lindale Assembly of God Church over in Lindale, north of Houston. And uh, just a plain old, plain old. I had to borrow $15 from Mama so we'd go on honeymoon. Where'd y'all go? 
Sam Marcus. Where'd y'all move after the honeymoon? We had a garage apartment. Guy I was working for with the railroad. His mama had this garage apartment, so we rented it from her. Had some neat neighbors. It was right there off of North Main Street, on you know, North Main Picture Show. And the people that lived next door to us was Mr. and Ms. Shorty. And it was a midgets. And they cooked all the popcorn in their house for the picture show. So it always smelled like popcorn every time you went home. Just living day to day. Plan, survive, and try to get ahead. Did you make decent money? $320 a month. Me and Mama and three-quarter born daughter. And we went to Cary, Illinois, in an old motor home that my friend had. It's from his hard hands been living in for about two years. So we drove that thing to Cary, Illinois, for an AI school of artificial insemination. So I was breeding cows, artificial breeding on cows. It was a good deal at the time. And uh, I carried a tank in the back of my truck. You could have two or three calls and eat and make you forty-five, fifty dollars. So it was pretty good. And but you were still working for the railroad. A lot of the people that I was working for for the railroad was daddy's people. So uh, we got a lot of a lot of railroad work the first few years. How did you even get to where you had your own company? You're working for the railroad one day, and then you're few phone calls. Really? They was a good bunch of guys. And told them what I was doing, and they said, come ahead, so get your insurance, and let's go. Lots of help. And the good Lord was watching. And so all worked out. See, I was, we left that part out where I was working for another construction company after the railroad. Oh, you took another job after the railroad? Yeah. Who was, what, what was that? I know when they were working in plants and done rail work. And all. So I had a pretty good lift up. Uh, they helped me out a lot. Just a lot of help, a lot of help. When you were a tiny little company, what type of work were you doing? I wouldn't. Just going around the edge and snipping it, seeing what could find. Okay. A lot of planning. Just pouring concrete, doing foundations, doing... Yeah, uh, any kind of dirt work or ditches and concrete, asphalt. And we didn't get into the rail for a couple of years because I had some kind of non-competes with the contractor I was working for. You call it the mid-70s, you get into rail, and it, is the company growing at this point? Oh, yeah. We was doing everything, dirt, rail, and everything. And, uh, a lot of good friends. They give you a lot of things. So. That had a lot to do with the whole deal, friends. When we first got married, I bought... Uh, three and a half acres out there in Aldine and uh, with the help of my mama. Then we started clearing on it and worked out there every minute we had, you know, clearing and building and what. Then we built a house there and had a little office up front. And uh, so we operated that for several years. And... Uh, then we decided we were going to need a bigger office, so we, we, we tore the old office down, the old house, and built a, our office that we're in now. When did y'all move to Belleville, and what was the motivation to get out of town? Kids, get them back in the country. You know, where I come from, we built a 
one of the 1,860-something model houses what we moved into. So it needed lots of tender love and care. And so we went to but a Pollock who built a house do not own a tape measure or a square or nothing straight. It's just made it up and and so we fought that old house for God I don't know how many years. I finally decided to build us a new one so we can build the new one we're in now. The other one we moved it off the place where were another guy's. So would you commute all the way? Every day, 70 miles. You know, it wasn't that bad when we first started, but uh, now it's terrible with all the traffic and stuff. How did the company continue to grow, and what type of work did you get into? Well, let's see. I guess the biggest spur would have been when the big pipeline deal all over the country started, and the country was just jumping up and down for oil field pipe. And so we was into pretty building these pipe yards and stuff, which are pretty heavy duty type of deal. And so we went on with that, built a lot of pipe yards. And uh, then a lot of those pipe yards had to have rail service, so we built a rail. Then you get into the 90s, and you got, that's where Minute Maid, or Enron Field comes along. How did you get that contract? Was it just a, a bid? Negotiate. Did you already know a bunch of the players at this point? Yeah, we knew some of them. We'd done some other work for them. It was all the rail yard before Minute Maid. That's where all the troops went out near World War II. Everybody gets in here from around the Houston area, and They'd go to wherever they was going. We got to working in there, and it was just an old rail yard, just old rails and trash. We had all the people down there with all their little brooms and their cameras and all, and you know, looking for history. Comes by out, we hit a a rooftop right underneath where first base is today. That's how much field was in there. There was a roof of, of just a building? Yeah, just a house. And so once we did that, that was a good thing. But uh, here come all the little genealogy people with their little rooms and, and oh, whoa, 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 we're going we to do this and do this. So we went on Cost Plus for the next year. When you look at the whole picture, you take it down to that elevation. It uh, just about down to bio. So they just got up on the bank of the bio, built a house. What was y'all's job at, at the time, Reliant? Same thing? Yeah. We dug all the dirt out and done all the paving and parking lots, everything except the building. Your company has a, a good reputation out in the world. Sure. And that comes from somewhere. Where does it come from? How does one get a good reputation and maintain it? Do what you say you're going to do. One of the best things I guess we've done, one of them was deer hunting. While I was working for Spinoza, they were big into deer hunting. I had all my customers going on Spinoza lease, you know, when I was working for Spinoza. And so we never skipped, I didn't miss a weekend. And we just kept on going with it, so we're good. Part of the secret of your success was taking clients deer hunting? That's one of them, one of them. It sure is, very much. Yeah, hunting a mini squirrel, a fox and coyotes. Where do you hunt fox? Where we was raised at in Fed County. Grandpa Bother, man, he would, He'd see me coming, and he'd start waving. He couldn't wait to unload me in here with you. Great old man hunting you. He was hunting cows, but if you was meat hunting, 
He's on squirrel. So. You had your sh fair share of squirrel dumplings? Oh, did, yeah. My grandmas could both. They could pick a squirrel out and he was going to be tender. Right? There's going to be no tough squirrel. They knew how to do it. We got a saying around the family. said, don't get the wrath of Risa after you. Shame on your butt. She ain't changed. Go get her. Get her done. Never stop. She's been like that since she was a little girl and still goes that way, runs the family. Just about, you know. She, well, you better ask Risa first, you know, or something. Bill was never a problem. He got into a few little scrapes that every boy's going to get into. In the end, he come out good on it. And most of the time, I was sitting back listening to him. And that's a big thing is listen to what the younger generation is saying. They'll give you a lot of light. He was more of a girl hound than I was. And uh, so he, he stayed pretty busy. Well, he went to Sam Houston, and uh, so they had a pretty good rodeo team, so he went all the way through on that and did okay. And Jesse's right behind him, and Jesse's got a lot of side deals going and stuff, but Jesse's been good, very, very good to me. What was he like as a little one? Like a little rat haired dog. <laughs> Always had his nose in there or something, but no, he was he is good. Good as gold. I mean he tastes good for me. And uh, had a tribute thing we had not too long ago. Everybody in the family was speaking and Bill got up and said he sure wanted to thank Jesse for all he'd done with me. And all he was saying was, I didn't have to mess with him, Jesse did it. So, but anyway. And then between Bill and Jesse, Beth comes along. Yeah. What was Beth like? She was poodle, poodle dogs and that type of thing. She was a more social type of person and uh, but he's been a perfect perfect daughter I love that man I was hoping there'd be some kind of dirt <laughs> no nah, that's mama she you know get her from hanging out these honky tonks and stuff would be all right. no don't even think about that yeah I don't see that being an no issue. that's not a problem she's got this school she started down here Faith Academy and um, it's been, well, how long have we been there, 28 years? In a little town like this, uh, I think she's got 350 kids, and she runs it like that all every day. Knows everything about everybody. She's on the hospital board here. and uh, Yeah, well, rodeo was our big thing. Uh, we had two of them. That was rodeo and pretty steady. We was hauling them somewhere two or three times a weekend. So we kept occupied with that. Then we got a, a rope and arena and everything at the house. And so she wasn't on the road. He was down there practicing. But that Bill and Jesse both, they got more buckles on the wall and trophies. and Yeah. They were, they were pretty decent. Well, now we got we have it on uh, Wednesday night during the summer. Boys had it here. We've got it enhanced it. Jesse runs it, and uh, I'm watching all of your grand grandkids, great grandkids, and stuff. And they're 
very into it, like it. Was your house kind of the center, the hubbub of of their social circles? No. Again, church was always a lot of entertaining and stuff with church people and church parties, stuff like that. I had a question that says, what are some stories that you've heard before but you would like to know more about? And Reese said, Daddy and Big Alvin wrangling and working cattle for extra money. What's she talking about? When is this? It was all the time. He had a pastor to join me, and we just got to be real good friends. And we worked cattle together, and his cattle and my cattle. And Who's Big Alvin? You don't know Big Alvin? Sure, where you been? But, uh, no, he was a, a pipe fitter, worked out of the Union Hall. Just a real good guy, just an honest, hard-working, wore-out cowboy. You make more money over here going pinning a bunch of cows than you could doing the job back in Houston or just seen. But uh, we made some good money off cow trading and all that kind of stuff. You said that you left Spinoza and you started W.T. Byler. What made you leave Spinoza? It sounds like things were going okay. It was, and uh, I was in charge of the railroad department over Spinoza. And the boss man told me if I could do, I forget what the number was, but it was a pretty sizable number. There'd be a big old raise in it for me and all this. So time came and went and nothing came, so. Did you hit the number? Yeah, I achieved the number. What made you guys decide to start looking for land in LaGrange and then Belleville? What was it that motivated you guys to say, we need some space? Well, first of all, we was looking around because I was 70 miles where we live now from the office. So I was looking for something you know, manageable, because at that time, back 40 years ago, you know, it was drivable, 290 was. We was all from Fed County, and I just liked that country, knew a lot of people up there, so that's the reason we did that. We bought 120 acres right there, where we're at now, originally. Would you be able to tell us about Granddaddy and Grandma Flake's store in West Point? Do you remember it? Oh, yeah, I was there when I was born and there when I left. There was a one pump service station, and then um, he had a little meat market in the back, had a smokehouse, and he changed all on your, on your truck. If he could, you pull up on these ramps and, he, and you crawled in under there and you loosened the blood and drained the oil out, he'd spread it down the road kill the weeds, but uh, he was he was a good old man. Raised, man, he raised the best gardens. No water, just got what he could. It's still sitting there, got a Texaco sign on it, and uh, the old house is still there. I don't know, I think they've sold it or something now, but, and they made an apartment out of the old service station. And uh, oh, we had lots of good times. It was a hangout for, well, it was the only thing in West Point, Texas, but where we had the post office, but it was too far. And uh, so it was a little service station. And Grandpa had a, so if you pulled into his service station, it was on Highway 71. And uh, so all the business went out on the other, going toward Flatonia. So everybody knew that you could go through Grandpa's place and not have to get out on 71 and get hit or something. Like that. So it was a pretty popular spot, too. Well, I mean, you can get an oil change and some jerky. Oh, yeah. And RC cola. Lunch meat and a bit of clothes and stuff like that. It was a full blown store. Even by dip snuff, we used to, he had these, I guess, candy cases made out of wood, about that tall glass doors on them. 
and they run up to the back door. And so us kids, we'd get an operating grandpa in there, get him up front, and a couple sneak in the back door. He can try to get them glass doors open without making a noise. And didn't make it very many times. He'd holler at you, get out of that candy bar. But uh, we'd go in there and reach our hand up in there and just sneak us a little bit of candy. All you had to do is go to Grandma and say, Mom, I need a nickel for candy. She'd give it to you anyway, so anyway. And then she wants to know if you know what made Meemaw and Papa Byler leave West Point. Well, when the old folks died on both sides, he started giving that land away that he had. He didn't, he didn't have a whole, I think, 500 acres is all he had and five kids, so he chopped it up. And they all went up there. And, you know, his first thing was bring them a travel trailer and they was going to have a country place and that lasted till they got hot. And, and then that's the end of that story. So, and mom and daddy was one of them that had a little place. I imagine it's just wore out and didn't want didn't want jack with that one land. It's glorious land in Texas. It's just old post oak needle grass. This comes from several of the kids where they talked about how growing up how God made a Sabbath for a reason and you you did your best to take that seriously. Yes, sir. Tell me about that. Well, we did. We went to church every Sunday, and one of the nights we could go, and then uh, we tried to arrange it. It was family day on Sunday, and, you know, we don't plan those excursions, you know, when they was younger. And, uh, but I got a lot more laps on that this time. Well, well that's what makes the family the family. What we're talking about. Do what you say you're going to do. Act right. Ain't nobody works harder than this bunch. The four kids, and then now it's the grandkids. They reach and get it every day. You watch and listen to them, and they said Beth Ann's boy, his name's Troy Lee. And uh, I watch him because he's more like me. Mac, he's quiet. And takes care of business and so I kind of keep my eyeball on him and he knows I'm watching him too. When you're out at the ranch, what are the things you like to do when, when you're out there? Load up grandkids and ride around. See, all my kids learn how to drive. Driving one of them things, an old mule. I think my wife did too. So, but uh, every one of them has got one or two of them that, they bum around in, like Bill, he lives out here about five miles. And uh, got that feedlot and stuff. And he, I mean, he lives for that, getting them kids up in that truck, going checking cattle and very important to him. We talk about this all the time, that uh, of the things you can get done. I mean, you can go leave here and say, I'm going to go by the bank and by the city hall and the lawyer's office and the office supply. And you get it all done in 15 minutes, you know, instead of running out Southwest Freeway or something, yeah. And so it's just a convenience of having the people. You've got to watch it. You've got to learn your people who's, who you can trust, who you can't trust. We got that down pretty good now, so. Right now, if I didn't have this thing, what am I trying to say, bladder thing going on, I'm enjoying life now more than I have. It's just scared that it's going to all go down and tank, you know, but uh, I don't know. I've kind of changed my perspective on how I look at things and appreciate things and Appreciate Mama and what she does. And it's a pretty special time right now. All right, Jesse's last. I got to go to Miss Beth. She talked about shooting turtles. Oh, that was, still is. That's a big day. 
Got to get some snappers out of the water, right? Yeah. Some turtles and cows. Right now, we really hunt the cows. They got so bad hogs. And, uh, Y'all have hogs issues? Oh, Lord, yeah. I used to brag I didn't have no hogs 20 years ago. Now I'm covered up with them. What does Beth give you for Christmas every year? A box of chocolate covered cherries. Yeah, I didn't get nothing this year. They were on the back of my truck. And I noticed the kids had them out the other day and they was eating on them. So I still get the box, but she everybody just, God, that's from 30, 40 years ago. She'd always give me a box. That was my favorite. What's in Bandera? Beth, she said that the, the memories in Bandera are some of her favorite. Yeah, we bought a ranch up there. Mm. How long ago we bought that thing? 75, 70s. That's a good guy. We built a big old lodge up on top of a mountain. Got a road going all the way up to it. We had lots and lots and lots of good time. Got a running creek on it. And uh, so I dammed it up and built a waterfall type of thing. A really nice place. You get up on this mountain at the house and walk out on the back porch and you, just, you, know, you can see San Antonio from there. Yeah, we got a fire pit and a hot tub and got the cold swimming hole there is. There's a creek running through it. And say I got it dammed up. It's about 15 feet there to the dam. And you jump up in that water to take your breath. You know, just, oh. Yeah, we've ever had, had lots of good memories and and from up there, and it's hard to go up there anymore because Mama I used to take off from school, so we don't get up there very often. With Beth, she says, I am a daddy's girl. Daddy has always been larger in life and the strongest man I know. She said y'all are a lot alike. Yeah, we are. You and Beth? Get her doing. She said, "If uh, if Daddy likes you, he'll give you a nickname. You a nickname guy? <laughs> How does she know that? Guess paying attention." And then my last one was Mr. Jesse Byler. We talked about Lord's Prayer and the Jesus story at Christmas. Yeah, y'all do that regular. Mm -hmm. When he says riding around the pasture talking about old times, what does he mean? I don't know what he was talking about old times. It was, I mean, we make old times every time we go out there. Just a good place for the kids to come and, the, you know, and fishing and all the other like cows, hogs. She asleep. Snow way. You took piano lessons? What's it to you? Yes. I don't know where the piano lesson a couple. But I did. I sat in that house and played the piano many evenings. All the other kids running around hollering, Liberace, Liberace. And that wasn't good? No, that wasn't good. Uh, I didn't want to be Liberace. Your wife pointed out that you guys always made family time important. We did. What exactly did you tell Bill about the bronzed hand plaque when you sold the company to Bill? He showed me that yesterday, sitting right there. And I was trying to remember it. I could not remember one thing about it, so I don't know nothing about it. So tell her the same thing. I don't know nothing. We can make something up, no? Yeah, make something up and sound good. She said, I thought he said to Bill, boy, you just always remember that I was already running this company when your handprint was that little. That's good. That's a good one. I, I got to remember that one. Your maternal grandfather, Mr. Charlie Flake, married your paternal grandmother, Nettie Flake, when they were in their 80s? We don't believe in rushing into anything. You've been long engagement, man. Yeah, you gotta, you know, you gotta spend 50, 60 years there. Uh, but what the deal was, was, well, they had their husbands, and which was my grandpa and grandma, and 
they passed. So they was going to make it on their own. So he'd bought him an old Chrysler car. And they go out riding and all. So he called me up one day. He said, Bubba, he said, I got a problem. I said, what is it, Grandpa? He said, I run off in a ditch and tore the front end of my car. I said, Grandpa, how did you do that? Oh, he called her Net. He said, I was messing with Net. <laughs> Eighty something years old. <laughs> anyway, they they were good people. See, now the truth comes out from your wife. I should have just talked to her. Yeah, it's true. You made it sound like you just kind of rolled out of bed and started the company. I did. Your wife alleges otherwise. She said that getting W. T. Bilerco was very hard. You had one eye on a dozer operator and one on a bean counter. I don't know where she come up with that, but it was a job just to keep them all straight and keep work for every one of them every day. And Is there anything that as you've grown older that you appreciate now that maybe you didn't when you were a young man? Parenting. How important it is, how people don't pay attention to it, what it means to that, to you and also to you, offspring. You took your role as father very seriously? Yes, sir. And as husband? And bouncer. And bouncer? We always bouncers. <laughs> All them boys coming out the house, throwing them out there. Beth used to come, uh, and she had some Lulus come by there, poodle dogs and all that stuff. But it did take long for them to get eliminated. How important is your family to you? Everything. Everything. Well, Mama had a good example. We, we've got one, two, three, four places going right now that the kids, we give them the land. And uh, it might be 700 acres in that place. But you take a young couple who's got a couple of little kids and you give them 700 acres. God, you know, that you're free to do what you want to do with it. There's four or five of them that's building on it and improving and stuff. And that was her idea to see them enjoy it before we. Just one, two houses going up now that they're building. Yeah, they don't need me right now. They're doing good. Doing real good. But that comes from one thing. Parenting. Just like them two boys right there. Beth's. Man, I think the world is... The one led down the young one, he... He was born back in February, I guess, and uh, had got some bad heart problems. And, you know, just, and then you're right to see a little kid have to go through operations. And stuff. I don't get like this around nobody else. Well, the only reason I'm doing it, I'm doing it for the kids, is they want to do it. I was going to draw a better picture of it. Except for these dang ailments I'm getting now. And, you know, it's been a pretty, a pretty perfect trip. Do your own thing, live your own life. Keep it between the lines.
I'd wear a WT Byler if you had one, though. <laughs> I like hats. <laughs> oh, you do? <laughs> yeah. Put it on, yeah. Oh, I would up. Don't you worry. That's awesome. I need that on camera. My name is Chance McLean. <laughs> It's going to be a long day, isn't it? Are you recording it? Oh. That's where the family kind of hails from? Yeah, but hillbillies. But uh, you don't have to put that in there. Somebody's going to kill me if I put this in there. You know, everybody in Houston makes trips to the beach. Did y'all ever go to Galveston? Let's talk about something else. Okay. Judy, Sandra. Clinette, did those names ring the bell? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, buddy. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Did you formally propose? Say what? Did you, did you like ask the dad and all that? Did you go through all that? What do you have to do with it? No, oh, yeah. That's a trade secret. Well, this movie's for the family. So oh, okay, okay, okay. What are you laughing at? Don't mind. Yeah. With, with 43 of them? Uh-huh. I was, I was, when he went through Magnolia, I was standing outside. Who was that guy? I was wondering who that fool was standing behind that tree. <laughs> what is it that's so good about the country? Kassan is. It's the girls around the rodeo. <laughs> Dummy. <laughs> Anything that, that caused you consternation and trepidation? Constipated. Well, that's, we all have that. Right? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Anything okay. like messing with the cows? Like yeah, because they were money. Like they were money. Yeah. I couldn't get a dime for them grandkids. How thick is this thing going to look like a Sears Roebuck catalog? Man, you're going to look like Gene Autry. I mean, this is going to... I never liked Gene Autry. Yeah, really? Nope. <laughs> yeah, I did. Well, you don't like them or what? What are you talking about, Willis? How important is your family to you? I don't care about nothing. Put that in your book. Besides, it's four o'clock. I still got a sloppy hogs and feed the chickens. <laughs>